Good afternoon. Currently, all participants are in a listen-only mode. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Throughout the webinar, please enter your questions in the chat Q&A pod located to the left of the presentation. Please type any technical questions in the same pod. The link to download a PDF of the slides is also located listed in a note pod to the left of the presentation. Please cut and paste the link into your web browser for easy download. If at any time you have difficulty hearing the webinar, please dial 866-792-6260 to listen using your phone. I would now like to turn it over to your moderator for today, Matt Belbeck. Hello, my name is Matt Belbeck and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Welcome to the CCH online webinar, Whistleblowing, Professional Duties and Best Practices for In-House Counsel. CCH has developed this online webinar in partnership with the Canadian Corporate Counsel Association. Today's webinar will provide you with an introduction to key whistleblowing legislative provisions and cases. It will also address the duties of in-house counsel who rep report illegal activities. You will learn about some best practices for creating effective policies and procedures to create a safe environment for whistleblowing. Upon conclusion of today's session, you will be directed to complete a brief online survey. Please participate. Your opinion is very important to us. Survey participants will be entered into a draw to win $100. We will provide instructions to access this survey at the end of the webinar. Please note that the link to today's PowerPoint presentation slides is provided on the left-hand side of your screen. You will also be emailed the slides and several unanswered questions that will be submitted today after the web webinar, along with a link to the recording. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to our keynote speakers for today, Lisa Fong of Ing Aris Fong, Joelle Berry from College of Massage Therapists of BC, and Madeline Menard from NAV Canada. Lisa Fong practices a blend of commercial and administrative law with a focus on professional conduct and ethics. She advises clients on employment and professional duties. She's experienced in giving advice on difficult or complex issues that include privacy and confidentiality, conflicts of interest, duties to report, and whistleblowing. Lisa's clients include corporations, professional regulatory organizations, and professionals. Lisa regularly speaks on professional ethics and is a member of the CBA National Ethics Committee, which reviews professional ethics issues for lawyers. She and her colleagues at Ing Aris Fong publish a blog on administrative law and professional regulation. The link to the blog is in the note pod on your left. Joelle Berry is the Director of Compliance at the College of Massage Therapists of BC. In this role, Joelle provides support for the College's responsibilities in the area of investigation, inquiry, discipline, and unauthorized practice. Joelle is a, is a lawyer with a broad range of experience, mostly, most recently as an investigator for the Teacher Regulation Branch of the Ministry of Education. She has a law degree from Dalhousie University and is a qualified civil mediator. Madeline Menard is an assistant general counsel at NAV Canada, the private not-for-profit corporation who owns and operates the air navigation system in Canada. Madeline provides legal services to the business units of NAV Canada in areas including finance, bankruptcy, and insolvency, litigation management, contract negotiations, human resources, and regulatory matters, and represents NAV Canada before the Canadian Human Rights Commission. I would now like to hand things over to Lisa Fong. Welcome, Lisa. Good morning. In my part of the presentation, I'm going to discuss the law of whistleblowing in Canada, both the common law and the statutory law. I'm also going to refer to some cases and statutes from other jurisdictions just to give you a flavor of other approaches. Now, I titled this part of my presentation as Desperately Seeking Whistleblowing because in Canada, whistleblowing legislation happens mostly within statutes, but it happens as a patchwork of statutes. So it's not that, it, that all this legislation is in one or two or three main federal statutes but, or provincial statutes, but rather in a plethora of federal and a plethora of provincial statutes. So my presentation today will cover what is whistleblowing, what are the interests engaged in whistleblowing, we're going to focus and spend a little time talking about those competing interests, and I'm going to talk to you about where are you going to find whistleblowing law in Canada. I've got two polling questions in my presentation and a very short Q&A at the end, 
So please participate in the polling questions. And if I don't get to your question during my presentation, I'm going to do my best to get you an answer offline. Thank you. So, so we're going to start with what is whistleblowing? So it is when a person, and that's often an employee, but it doesn't always have to be an employee. It can be a contractor, a supplier, or for example, a professional provides a service that you're going to hear from, and from Joelle, within an organization that may be a public or a private actor who knows or suspects of wrongdoing. And wrongdoing, the typical ones are acts that constitute offenses, breaches of law, or threats to public safety or health, or involve acts of fraud or deceit and where this person's reported or may report to authorities, um, and by authorities, it could be up the ladder, i.e. internal authorities, or external authorities, such as agencies, or to the public, such as the media, and this person may face retaliation. And the typical forms of retaliation, as we're gonna see in some of the cases in the legislation, is through dismissal, discipline, changes to employment terms, or other forms of discrimination. Now, whistleblowing law operates to balance two opposing interests. The first is preserving duties of fidelity, including confidentiality within organizations so that organizations can function. And the second is the public interest in having wrongdoing exposed and addressed. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna come back to these concepts, these competing interests, and discuss them more fully in relation to the Canadian common law and the Canadian statute. But first, we're just going to do a little segue into the U.S. experience. There we go. Because really, the statutory development occurs in this area of whistleblowing in the early 2000s. And in response to these, an outcry against the massive financial frauds that are happening in the United States. So in 2002, the U.S. federal government passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, which set new standards for public company boards management and accounting firms. That statute included criminal provisions aimed at protecting persons from retaliation, where they provide law enforcement with truthful information about the commission or possible commission of any federal offense. And most interestingly to me, in 2010, um, Section 21F was added to the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, which provides awards to individuals who provide information relating to a violation of securities laws of the Securities Exchange Commission, ranging from 10 to 30 percent of what is collected on monetary sanctions. And later on, um, at the end of my presentation, I'm going to get to an application of this sort of bounty or bad behavior, not in this act, but in a companion act in the United States that really shows you the flavor of how Americans have dealt with whistleblowing. But now, let's head back to <clears throat> a discussion on those two interests that are being balanced. So the first one is the duty of fidelity. The duty of fidelity requires that employees act in their employer's best interest. It's a contractual duty, and it's an implied term of contract if it's not there expressly. It requires honest and faithful conduct. It demands that employees refrain from harming the employer or placing its interests at risk. Employees may owe express or implied duties to maintain confidentiality over matters learned in the course of employment. There are exceptions. Um, and you see exceptions in the common law as well as exceptions most commonly in statutory provisions. So starting with the common law, it is the concept of iniquity. And I apologize here, if anyone's got their, their pen and they printed out the presentation, it should be I-N-I-Q-U-I-T. Inequity, of course, is a different kind of wrongdoing, but we're talking about inequity, which is really where a person's not obliged to hide or shield an employer's wrong. And I've given you the sites for two of the English cases that have sections that are off-cited, often most cited by um, Canadian law, explaining what iniquity is. And I'm just going to take us very quickly to the second one, because I think it's got a great little statement by the judge there, Gartside and Utrum, um, where the judge explained iniquity in this way. The true doctrine is that there is no confidence as to the disclosure of iniquity. 
You cannot make me the confidant of a crime or a fraud and be entitled to close up my lips upon any secret which you have the audacity to disclose to me relating to any fraudulent intention on your part. Such a confidence cannot exist. Um, you'll see in the case law, if you do a quick sight of Ansley and Gert's side, that many of these cases have been followed in our Canadian jurisdiction, and in British Columbia in particular, the case of Steintron International Electronics. And for you, those of you who want to write that down, it's S-T-E-I-N-T-R-O-N, International Electronics, V. Vorberg, V-O-R-B-E-R-G, 1986, D.C. Supreme Court. And that was where the court accepted that a claim for a breach of confidentiality could succeed at trial due to confidentiality not extending to fraud. And that brings us to the exceptions in the statutory provisions that implicitly authorize disclosure. And those statutory provisions in Canada are patchwork, as you'll see shortly, covering different people, different industries, and different forms of wrongdoing. So let's take a closer look at the dimensions of these exceptions. So whether you're looking at a common law exception or you're looking at a statutory exception, it's useful to examine these dimensions, certain dimensions, in order to understand the scope of your exception. And I've set out five categories that I've identified in looking at the legislation and looking at the common law. The first is the types of wrongdoing that can be reported. Um, second, the sufficiency of the basis for reporting. Third, the good faith of the reporter. Fourth, the distinction between internal and external reporting. And fifth, forms of reprisal that the law prohibits. So let's go through those. So in types of reportable wrongdoing, there's the two common law cases, which are also typically used in this area of law. Um, English law, in England, the English courts have worked to classify the sorts of wrongdoing that can trigger an inequity exception to the common law of fidelity and confidentiality. One of the earliest cases is that of Lord Denning, Master of the Rules, where he referred to actual or contemplated crimes, frauds, and misdeeds. And that's in the case of initial services and puteral. And I recommend a good read of that case because it's got lots of other good principles in relation to whistleblowing. And then the case which Canadians are most familiar with is the case of Fraser and Canada, which is really shaped whistleblowing defense, and that's a Supreme Court of Canada case. And that was a case where a supervisor with Revenue Canada was discharged for repeatedly criticizing the federal government's policies on the metric system and the Charter of Rights. Um, the Supreme Court in that case, I'll give you a little excerpt of what it said. In some circumstances, a public servant may actively and publicly express opposition to the policies of a government. This would be appropriate if, for example, the government were engaged in illegal acts or if its policies jeopardized the life, health, or safety of the public servant or others, or if the public servant's criticism had no impact on his or her ability to perform effectively the duties of a public servant or on the public perception of that ability. But having stated these qualifications, and there may be others, it is my view that a public servant must not engage, as the appellant did in this present case, in sustained and highly visible attacks on the major government policies. <clears throat> in conducting himself in this way, the appellant, in my view, displayed a lack of loyalty to the government that was inconsistent with his duties as an employee of the government. So you see that balancing part. Now, in the cases that follow Fraser, there, and there are lots of them, so we don't have time to go through them all in this presentation, you'll see that the courts are not readily expanding um, the list of wrongdoings which are listed by Fraser. And if you want to read more, um, cases I'd recommend to you would be Stenhouse and Canada and Reed and Canada. So Stenhouse is S-T-E-N-H-O-U-S, Reed is R-E-A-D, and they're both RCMP officer cases where these RCMP officers made disclosures of confidential information which were found not to fall within the common law exception of iniquity. So now let's move to statutes. Now, with statutes, in terms of types of reportable wrongs, I've categorized them for you. Um, 
you know, one of them would be provisions that protect reporting, and you're going to see this throughout in the BC Employment Standards Act um, and other Employment Standards Act statutes, and then resort to rights, which you will see in, for example, human rights code type statutes where there is, um, you know, where, where one can bring a claim, or you'll see them in statutes where where one can participate in a process under a particular statute of a regulatory scheme without fear of reprisal, such as in the Ombudsman's Act in British Columbia, where one can participate in investigations and be protected. And then um, another example of a category would be provisions that protect reporting under two or more statutes. And one of the examples of that would be the Ontario Environmental um, Protection Act. And then a third category would be provisions that specify a broader array of covered wrongdoings. And a good example of that is the Criminal Code, Section 425.1, where there's no retaliation or compulsion to abstain from providing information to, um, law, to law enforcement you know, about an offense contrary to this or any federal or provincial act or regulation. So very, very broad. Now, another dimension to look at when you're trying to examine these, these um, exceptions is the sufficiency of the basis for reporting. Um, so some statutes require a report of suspected wrongdoing be supported by some basis for belief. And <clears throat> some of the statutes only protect you if you have a reasonable belief. And I've given you two examples of that in the Canadian Environmental Protection Act as well as the Competition Act. And then another dimension of an exception would be the good faith reporting. Is there a good faith requirement? And there is, very interestingly, in the Public Servants Disclosure Protection Act. So in such an act, not only do you have to probably get it right and be reasonable, but you have to come from a place of good faith as opposed to malice. Very interesting policy decision. Our next consideration <clears throat> when you're looking at an exception would be internal and external reporting. So in the common law, generally, a report may be acceptable if made to one who has a proper interest to receive the information. And that's, you know, the place where that gets started and where it's established in the common law um, is back to initial services by Lord Denning. Um, but for statutory exceptions, unless it's actually expressly provided in the statute, internal before external. The courts and arbitrators have articulated a preference for reports to attempt internal reporting mechanisms first. And the case of William Scott and Company is very helpful to explain this to us. Just one moment. Here we go. Um, so this was a case where two corrections officers breached their statutory duties to not disclose information they learned in the course of their employment, except as required to perform their duties authorized by their director or as required by law. Rather, they repeatedly appeared on and made comments on talk radio shows, critical about corrections board, about criminal activities allegedly promoted, condoned, and covered by that corrections branch. The arbitrator concluded that they had properly been dismissed. Their disclosures breached their duty of fidelity on the basis that their allegations were unfounded, that they did not make a reasonable effort to determine if their allegations were even accurate, and they did not make use of internal mechanisms. And here's what the arbitrator in that case had to say. <clears throat> While an employee's duty of fidelity <clears throat> to an employer does not prevent him in every circumstance from publicly criticizing his employer, it is recognized that public criticism is not the first step that should be taken in order to bring wrongdoing within the enterprise to the attention of those who can correct it. In other words, while an employee in some circumstances may be forced to go public, e.g. concerning an unsafe chemical or machine which his company produces, before doing so, he should attempt to get all the facts and give his employer an opportunity to explain or correct the problem. Most employers have a variety of mechanisms formal or informal, under which an employee may lodge a complaint about the manner in which the enterprise should be operated. Only if no satisfaction results from these channels, then and only then may an employee go public. And there are you know, great sections in that case. So if you're looking at 
um, whether you're going to have to report up the ladder or externally, those are the cases. William Scott and Merck is where you should begin. Okay. Now, there's a polling question. And the, I'm just going to move on to the, the fifth exception, which are the prohibited forms of reprisal, so another dimension which you should look at. So right to disclose under common law or statute means under private agreements and absence of grounds for an employer to summarily dismiss an employee. And you'll see this throughout um, the most common statutes are those in the Employment Standards Act. And then under collective agreements, an absence of cause for an employer to dismiss or discipline a worker. And again, the most common ones there are, again, the employment ones, but this time the Labor Act because it's a collective agreement. And then where statutes afford specific protections, a bar on stipulated acts that's likely to be worded very generally, e.g. through prohibitions on acts involving adverse effects or that discriminate against, intimidate, coerce, or penalize. And I'll reference you back to that section of the Criminal Code 425.1, which is a really good example because the prohibitions on um, reprisal include um, disciplinary measures, um, termination, and very broadly, otherwise adversely affecting employment. So now the question becomes, where do you find whistleblowing law because it is such a patchwork. So what we did in preparation for this presentation was we looked through six provinces and you know a variety of uh, federal legislation and we compiled together all this legislation. We thought, okay, well how do we organize this so that if you had to look for whistleblowing legislation, there'd be some way at least identifying where to look. And what we did was we categorized it based on um, uh, on hopefully, you know, industries or persons that would help you. So this isn't a comprehensive listing. We're going to go through this very quickly to help you. Um, so where an offense is involved, you'll see two listed. Where any statutory breach is involved. <coughs> where public servants are involved. This is a very common area. Where privacy rights are involved. And probably the more the most fruitful area where employment rights, labor rights, or workplace safety is involved, where human rights are involved, where environmental protections are involved. And I didn't even get into, in this section, just a flag for you, those of you who work in, um, <clears throat> in the environmental industries like mining and so forth, there are very specific provisions in, for example, yes, the mining acts of each of the provinces. And then various regulatory schemes. And if you look through these, the continuing theme seems to be um, statutes that address um, health issues, self-regulatory um, governing agencies for professionals, and vulnerable people. So those seem to be the themes. Now, I'm just going to very, very quickly talk very shortly about three cases, um, just because I think they're really interesting cases. And they'll give you a flavor of where the, where the world is um, on whistleblowing outside of Canada. So let's go to Heinisch and Germany. And this was the, Europe, the European Human Rights Court. So it's a very high bar for women reprisal against a whistleblower can be justified as a restriction on an individual's freedom of speech. This case involved a finding that a dismissal of an employee for whistleblowing constituted an infringement of a freedom of speech under the European Convention on Human Rights, even where the alleged act of whistleblowing was found to lack sufficient evidence for the investigation to proceed, and it appeared that the alternate goal of the public attention for denunciation of short staffing was the goal as opposed to good faith, and it fell short of any criminal conduct that might be subject to an investigation. Um, in dealing with the decision of the German Labor Court of Appeal, the European Court of Human Rights applied a balancing test that was very similar to that we apply in Section 1 of the Charter in Canada. And as an interference with the whistleblower's freedom of expression, the interference had to be proportionate to the legitimate aim pursued. In this case, the overseeing European Court found that the dismissal of the whistleblower was not proportionate and it sets an interesting high bar for when restriction of whistleblower freedom of expression can be justified. 
Um, the next case I'm going to tell you about is U.S. Greg Thorpe v. GlaxoKline, GlaxoSmithKline. And this was a case that was decided under the Federal False Claims Act, also known as the Lincoln Act of 1863. So it's been on the books for a really long time, and it's the other companion act on the what I would call the, the bounty um, hunting aspect of whistleblowing law. This was a complaint brought by four former employees of the pharmaceutical company Glaxo under that act, which incentivizes whistleblowing by allowing whistleblowers to receive a portion of money the government recovers from prosecuting for fraud. In this case, Glaxo agreed to pay a $3 billion to the U.S. to settle the complaint, which alleged a fraudulent scheme to deceive and defraud physicians, patients, regulators, and federal health care programs in order to have their drugs prescribed. As the fine levied against Glaxo in the settlement was $1 billion, the statutory minimum payout to the complainants was at least $150 million to be shared between the four of them. So that's just a that's a really interesting approach to regulating bad behavior within corporations, um, which we don't see currently in Canada. And then lastly, I just want to reference for you Kessing um, v. R, which is a case coming out of New South Wales in New Zealand. And this was uh, this is a really interesting case because we actually have similar legislation, and I don't know in Canada whether this would have occurred. So this was an unsuccessful appeal of a criminal conviction in Australia against a whistleblower who had worked in customs at Sydney Airport. As a public employee, he was under a duty not to disclose a report that came into his possession, and having been found to have done so, he was sentenced to a suspended prison term of nine months. So he worked as part of an intelligence unit in the Australian Customs Service called the Air Border Security Team. They produced two threat assessment and risk analysis reports. He had access to the reports, and the reports involved information with respect to drug trafficking, airport security passes being given to illegal immigrants and people with criminal convictions, and the report was allegedly buried after being produced in 2003. Mr. Kessing, he eventually resigned from his job, and later on in May 2005, two news articles were published through an investigation, it was found that he had a copy of the reports in his home and that um, the name and address of the journalists were on those reports. So, you know, it's interesting. And of key note, Mr. Kessing has signed an official secrets acknowledgement document prohibiting him from disclosing information found in the course of his duties as a public servant. And if you look at our Canadian legislation, we have similar protections for official secrets. Um, to those in our criminal code and in the Security of Information Act ourselves. So that takes me to um, the end of my presentation. And I believe I have time for, there's a polling question coming, and but I also think I've got time for one question. So while you guys answer the poll, polling question, I am going to answer I got several questions, so I'm going to answer the one question. And the one question, uh, the first question I'll answer is this. The question is, many statutory protections for whistleblowing seem to require a minimum threshold of a reasonable belief before they can be relied on. How is it determined when a whistleblower's belief is reasonable? Okay. So, so that's a great question because, you know, what does that mean? And you, in the case law, you'll see there's an objective aspect as well as a subjective aspect to testing whether there's a reasonable belief. And the subjective aspect is, is there an honest belief of the individual? And the objective aspect is, is there an honest belief of the individual based on actual facts which have some reasonableness to it? So that's all we have time for. Thank you very, very much. And now I'm going to hand it over to Joelle Berry, who will do the second part of this presentation. Okay, thank you, Lisa. I'm just going to get myself set up here. <clears throat> so what I'll be talking about is uh, what happens when in-house counsel becomes aware of the dishonest, illegal, or criminal actions that are taken or contemplated by their employer. While these lawyers will face similar ethical dilemmas to other employees, 
they'll also be subject to special duties and obligations that will constrain their ability to blow the whistle. Of relevance is the duty of confidence, fiduciary duties, and solicitor-client privilege. So I'll start with the duty of confidence. This duty can arise by way of contract or equity and applies to information that is treated as private and is not subject to disclosure. <clears throat> At common law, the information must be restricted from the public in order to be protected as confidential. For lawyers, the duty of confidence is also spelled out in the various codes of professional conduct set by law societies. Chapter 5 of the Law Society of British Columbia's Professional Conduct Handbook states that a lawyer shall hold in strict confidence all information acquired in the course of the professional relationship and shall not divulge any such information unless the disclosure is authorized by the client or is required by law or by a court. This duty will survive the termination of the solicitor-client relationship. And in BC, the duty of confidence for lawyers applies regardless of whether the information is publicly known. This differs from the common law, which holds that information will only be protected as confidential if its availability to the public is restricted. The Canadian Federation of Law Society's model code also provides that the duty of confidence survives the termination of the solicitor-client relationship. However, in the model code, this duty may not extend to protect information that is in the public domain. On a review of the various codes of professional conduct, the exceptions to the duty of confidentiality generally fall into one of four categories, where the disclosure is authorized by the client, authorized by law, where the disclosure is necessary to prevent a crime involving death or serious bodily harm, and when the disclosure is necessary to defend, an sorry, defend against an allegation of misconduct or civil action for malpractice to secure legal or ethical advice about proposed conduct or to establish or collect fees. So as you can see, there's no general exception for disclosure for the purposes of whistleblowing on an employer. In addition to the duty of confidence, in-house counsel also owes their employer certain fiduciary duties. Fiduciaries are held to a standard of conduct that can be expressed as a, as a duty of faithfulness or loyalty. The specifics of these duties will depend on the expectations of the parties and other circumstances. These duties underpin many of the duties owed by lawyers to their clients in the various codes of professional conduct. These include the duty to commit to the client's cause, the duty not to act in a conflict of interest, the duty of candor, and others. The only general exception to a fiduciary duty of loyalty is where the beneficiary consents or acquiesces to an action contrary to fiduciary obligations. However, the consent or acquiescence must be made explicitly by a fully informed and capable beneficiary. <clears throat> the various codes of professional conduct generally contain two relevant exceptions to the fiduciary duty of loyalty. The first prohibits lawyers from knowingly assisting in or encouraging fraud, crime, or legal conduct. And the second prohibits lawyers from counseling clients on how to violate the law and avoid punishments. After considering their duty of confidence and all fiduciary duties, in-house counsel will also need to consider solicitor-client privilege. I've gone too far there. So the rationale behind this privilege is the need to ensure that a client can frankly and candidly disclose all material facts to their solicitor so their solicitor can render proper legal advice. Now we're back on track. Solicitor-client privilege only applies to prohibit the disclosure of communications between a lawyer and a client that are intended to be confidential and are for the purposes of obtaining legal advice. Unlike confidential documents, privileged documents are exempt from compulsion by the courts or legislation. Where in-house counsel performs several different roles within an organization, careful attention must be paid to the types of communications that will qualify as being privileged. This will require in-house counsel to mindfully delineate tasks. The most common exception to solicitor-client privilege is waiver by the client. The various codes of professional conduct contain an exception to solicitor-client privilege 
that allows for disclosure where it can be demonstrated that there's an imminent risk of serious bodily harm or death to an identifiable person or group. A broader exception exists where an otherwise privileged communication was made in the course of a client seeking from seeking from sorry, seeking guidance from a lawyer in order to facilitate the commission of a fraud or a crime. When communications are made with a view to perpetrating tortious conduct that may be the subject of criminal proceedings, the same exception may apply. But more than a mere allegation of fraud must be made in, a, in order to overturn the privilege. A very limited exception also exists where solicitor-client privilege must be set aside in order to allow an accused to make a full answer in defense. The test for whether the privilege can be set aside in these circumstances is that it must be shown that the core issues going to the guilt of the accused are involved and there's a genuine risk of a wrongful conviction. This is known as the innocence at stake test. So can a lawyer blow the whistle? Aside from some narrow exceptions, lawyers owe a duty of confidence and fiduciary duties to their client employers that can only be waived by the client. The same holds true for privileged communications. So where does that leave the in-house counsel who becomes aware of wrongful conduct? The Canadian Federation of Law Society's model code addresses this by providing up the ladder reporting. Generally, this requires lawyers to advise the person from whom the lawyer takes instructions and the chief legal officer, or both the chief legal officer and the chief executive officer, that the proposed conduct is, was, or would be dishonest, fraudulent, criminal, or illegal, and should be stopped. And if those people within the organization refuse to cease the wrongful conduct, <clears throat> then the lawyer must go up the reporting ladder. This would be up to the board of directors, the board of trustees, or an appropriate committee of the board. If after going all the way up the ladder, the organization persists with the wrongful conduct despite the lawyer's advice, then the lawyer must withdraw from acting in the matter. Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, and others have adopted similar up-the-ladder reporting systems in their codes of professional conduct. However, in BC, no express guidance is given to lawyers in these circumstances currently. So up-the-ladder reporting does not authorize lawyers to notify authorities outside of the organization. And depending on the nature of the misconduct, this may ultimately result in a lawyer needing to resign from their employment or face professional discipline. One possible solution to this problem is to draft employment contracts for in-house counsel that expressly authorize the disclosure of information to outside authorities for relevant misconduct within the organization. An employment contract authorizing whistleblowing would need to be carefully crafted to authorize disclosure in spite of a lawyer's fiduciary duties, their duty of confidentiality, and possibly even solicitor-client privilege. Without clear waiver of these duties and privileges, a lawyer may be subject to discipline by their law society or civil liability for breach of confidence inter alia, despite acting in what they believe to be the public interest. In light of recent corporate scandals, the American Bar Association changed their model rules to permit whistleblowing by adding an exception to lawyers' confidentiality obligations. Under this rule, a lawyer can disclose confidential information flowing from the solicitor-client relationship in order to prevent the client from committing a crime or fraud that is reasonably certain to result in substantial injury to the financial interest or property or another, and to prevent or mitigate or rectify substantial injury to the financial interest or property of another that is reasonably certain to result or has resulted from the client's commission of a crime or fraud. The ABA model rules also provides an exception to the duty of confidentiality where a lawyer has undertaken up the ladder reporting to the highest authority in an organization, the organization has failed to address the wrongdoing, and the violation is reasonably certain to result in substantial injury to the organization. Though considered, the ABA model rules have not been adopted by the Canadian Federation of Law Societies to date. And so now we will go to a polling question. So do you think that Canadian law societies should permit lawyers to blow the whistle on their clients to outside authorities?
Okay. So it seems like the majority of people think yes. All right. So now I'll take uh, some questions, and I see that I have a few here. Am I good on time? Did I just blow through that? Yeah? Okay. Okay. So the yep. first question oh, that sorry, I have Oh, sorry, we have time is, for uh, three questions for this module. Okay. And uh, I, can, I can dictate those questions. Um, the first is, do a lawyer's fiduciary and confidentiality uh, duties apply only where a lawyer is acting in their capacity as a lawyer within the employer organization? So that's a, a very interesting question. And <clears throat> in looking at uh, the fact that solicitor-client privilege only attaches to communications made by in-house counsel in their role as lawyers, by extension, an argument could be made that the confidentiality and fiduciary duties will also differ when in-house counsel is employed to carry out multiple roles within an organization. Uh, notably, in-house counsel that also acts as a director of the company may hold other fiduciary duties to the company that differ, differ from those of a lawyer. Great, thank you. Uh, the second question is, what can in-house counsel do where others within an organization disclose information on misconduct uh, within the organization to you, but these individuals refuse to make their own report? So when the information comes to your knowledge, the consideration of whether or not you're in a position to disclose that information to authorities outside the organization will again depend on whether there are specific and explicit whistleblowing rights set out in your employment contract. Um, if not, then up the ladder reporting might be the only remedy that in-house counsel has available. Uh, it's also worth questioning whether in-house is obliged to tell the individual who's disclosing the information that that in-house counsel has severe impediments to their ability to disclose their information outside of the organization. Thank you. There's one more question in this module, and then we can move on to, to module three. Uh, the question is, lawyers have a duty to report misconduct by other lawyers to their governing body. Does this allow for whistleblowing where the misconduct involves the actions of another lawyer? Well, lawyers across Canada have a duty to report to their respective law societies uh, the conduct by other lawyers that raises a substantial concern with respect to another lawyer's honesty or trustworthiness as a lawyer. The Federation's model code, as well as the professional conduct codes and jurisdiction that closely follow this model, such as Alberta, Manitoba, and Ontario, set out specific examples of when such a duty to report will be triggered including participation in criminal activity. Notably, however, all of these jurisdictions that follow the model code make it explicit that the duty to report only operates to the extent that solicitor-client privilege is not breached. Similarly, in BC, the duty to report is qualified as not authorizing the disclosure of a client's confidential information or any privileged communication. Uh, again, the duty of confidentiality and loyalty to the client and the evidentiary concept of solicitor-client privilege override any duties a lawyer may have to the public or even to their own morality, um, except where the client consents to such disclosure, sorry, disclosure expressly through well-drafted employment contract terms. Great, thank you. That's all the time we have for questions in, in this module. presentation relates to the practicalities of creating uh, whistleblowing policies and procedures. Uh, in other words, my goal today is, is to show what they look like in the real world and, and how they're used. I have a first uh, polling question. Can that question be posted? While we wait for it, um, 
let me go on here. Um, I'm the Assistant General Counsel for NAV Canada. NAV Canada is, um, is a private company. It's the Canadian provider of air navigation services. Um, our services include air traffic control. Uh, we were previously a Department of Transport Canada, but we were privatized in 1996 as a non-share capital corporation when we purchased the air navigation system from the Crown. Uh, of course, uh, when we speak of air navigation services, we speak of safety in the air by keeping aircraft apart. Everything that we do here at NAV Canada relates to the safety of air travel. So in order to achieve this goal, um, whistleblowing takes on a whole new meaning and has a very important place here. It's not only desirable, it's essential to the safety of the air navigation system. Like most people have um, a whistleblowing policy within their organization. My presentation um, is divided as follows. First, I'll talk about the benefits of creating whistleblowing policies and procedures. Then I'll review the nuts and bolts of good policies and procedures. And then I'll conclude with remarks on fostering the environment for the successful use of those policies and procedures. At, uh, at NAV Canada, we, we've structured our whistleblowing uh, process into two main policies. And this is because our core business is very specific to operations and it lends itself well to a separate whistleblowing policy for the operational employees of the company, uh, i.e. most of them are air traffic controllers. Uh, we keep the operational whistleblowing activities separate and apart and subject to a different system from the rest of the company. However, our policies have the same, the two policies have the same general goal. And the benefits of creating whistleblowing policies and procedures include um, an effective way to capture grassroots knowledge from frontline employees and managerial staff. Um, it provides an opportunity to bring problems forward in a confidential way without fear of repercussions. It raises issues to senior management and flushes out concerns. It allows employees a voice to be heard. Um, it allows the company to address uh, the problems. It promotes an open and transparent work environment, and it enhances the ability to achieve corporate goals and objectives. The um, overarching principle behind our whistleblowing policy is our commitment to the highest standards of professional conduct. Um, here at NAV Canada, we collecti collectively feel that by adopting high standards and allowing employees to come forward and speak about wrongdoings, errors, or simple, um, simply about concerns, we enhance the reputation of the company, the engagement level and pride of each employee, uh, which translates in an organization that is better able to face challenges as they arise and to meet its goals and objectives. Because our goals and objectives are matters of life and death, our whistleblowing practices are an essential part of our safety management system. The whistleblowing policy related to safety is called Argus. Uh, the name Argus is derived from the Greek god of the guardian with a hundred eyes. Argus is applicable and open to anyone who has a safety concern in operational areas. Complaints or concerns can be made anonymously or openly. What matters is that they be submitted. 
The mechanics include the submission of the complaint either in writing or verbally to the immediate supervisor or to a confidential post office box, voice, message, or email address. They are acknowledged um, if, if they're not submitted anonymously, obviously. Uh, the concept of confidentiality is paramount and essential for its survival. We take all complaints seriously and they are all investigated, even if some of them may be from employees with an ax to grind. No judgment is made on the validity of the submission. There are, um, there are two managers, this is a very on a very practical basis, we have two managers who are sworn to confidentiality in our Office of Safety and Quality, which is a different uh, and separate department of the company, and they receive the complaint and they coordinate the resolution with the complainant. Of course, this is unless they're done anonymously. Reports are logged and they're submitted every quarter to the Safety Committee of the Board of Directors. So that's the, the part of uh, the complaints related to safety. So they can be anything from um, regulatory matters uh, or simple problems within a control tower or a control environment. And, and they they were all uh, investigated and, and dealt with appropriately. For all other whistleblowing matters uh, related to general issues, uh, financial or otherwise, we have our general policy of whistleblowing called Sentinel. Claims related to accounting, internal accounting controls, or auditing matters are submitted to our, our Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary, or the Chair of the Audit Committee. They're applicable to anyone inside and outside the company, so employees, customers, bargaining agents, suppliers, and other stakeholders can make complaints. Incorporates procedures for the confidential, anonymous receipt, retention, and treatment of complaints received. We ask that, the, that first uh, the complaints go to the immediate supervisor if it's done uh, in, a, in an open way, but it doesn't have to be that way. It can be sent to a, a confidential post office box, a voicemail, or an email address. Part of the process is that each complaint must be acknowledged immediately and a report is made to the complainant. The investigations are handled internally by our internal audit uh, department or by outside resources. Reports are logged and submitted quarterly to the audit committee of the board of directors. We have a polling question. Do you have a whistleblowing policy in your organization? Do you believe it to be an effective reporting tool? And it's interesting to see the results. The majority uh, splits 50-50 as to whether it's, a, a, it's a, an effective reporting tool. I'll 
talk a little bit about our code of business conduct. Uh, in order to provide meat to the whistleblowing system, we've created through the code of business conduct standards by which employees and contractors conduct themselves. The code of business conduct outlines the values of the organization, the responsibilities employees have in carrying out their, do, their jobs. This helps everyone in knowing that they are accountable for their behavior and for upholding the values and standards upon which the reputation of the organization rests. We believe that each employee plays a role in creating a work environment of openness, honesty, trust, and respect. The code clearly states the consequences of violations, and these include disciplinary action up to and including dismissal, as well as legal action in case of fraud. Among other things, the Code of Business Conduct talks of employment equity and diversity, relations with employee representatives, discrimination, harassment, and abusive behavior, workplace violence, occupational health and safety, official languages, security, uh, substance abuse, conflicts of interest, corporate information. The code specifically encourages employees to come forward with reports of violations of the, uh, the provisions of the code by stating that doing so equals doing the right thing. We also have, in order to, to provide a, uh, guidelines to our employees on how to behave, we have a corporate fraud policy. And it outlines the standards um, expected from, from everyone. Uh, the fraud policy is the framework for responding to fraud cases. As part of our duty to the organization, we have a zero tolerance for fraud, both outside and inside the company. The goal is to promote consistent organizational behavior by providing guidelines and assigning responsibility. Policy asks employees to be vigilant and to report any concerns they may have at the earliest opportunity. The scope of the policy applies to all employees and to those having a business relationship to the company. The overall goal is to improve the knowledge of everyone to the potential risk of fraud. It sets out responsibilities regarding prevention, detection, and investigation, and it assists in promoting a climate of openness and a culture and environment where everyone feels able to raise concerns. Fraud policy defines what constitutes fraud as the use by an employee of his or her position for personal enrichment through the misuse or misapplication of NAF Canada resource or assets, including removal, misuse, or destruction of company assets, false accounting, unauthorized disclosure or manipulation of sensitive information, forgery or alteration of any document belonging to the company, profiteering as a result of insider knowledge of company and customer activities, all for the purpose of personal gain, gain for another or with intent to cause loss to another. Policy also outlines the responsibilities of each of the organizations. The fraud committee composed of the vice president and human resources officer, the vice president general counsel and corporate secretary, and the vice president of finance, um, chief
chief financial officer and the responsibilities of the line managers and all employees. A few words on fostering the environment for the successful use of policies and, and procedures. I referred to what's outlined earlier, and uh, i.e. the two uh, whistleblowing policies, the code of business conduct and the corporate fraud policy and how they're interrelated. Uh, we've attempted to create an environment where, with these, uh, these policies, where openness, honesty, and trust are encouraged and are part of our values. That's the reason for the network of policies and systems put in place to achieve a workplace where everyone is responsible for their actions, knows the, expect, the expected standards of behavior and the consequences associated with failures. Everyone here is encouraged and comfortable to report wrongdoings without fear of reprisals. So to ensure that the system works well, um, we ensure that submissions go directly to the primary senior management. It applies to all levels of employees, and we train our employees to, to accept their responsibility to, uh, to whistleblow and, and to be vigilant about what goes on around them. We, we take all submissions to be to very seriously, we investigate each one of them, and the whole process is given high visibility within the organization. Polling question here. So I have um, a couple of questions uh, from our attendees. Uh, the first one, uh, how do we reach a resolution once a complaint is made? Um, well, here in our case, what we do is each, each complaint is fielded to the appropriate vice president um, of the, the department responsible for the area where the complaint is made. And this person will send it anonymously to the management responsible for the area of the complaint and obtain a report back with a proposed resolution. And then discussions will take place with the complainant uh, via the confidential channel. So this confidential channel obviously is, is, uh, includes contacting the complainant at home, okay, um, so that none of the information can be shared uh, within the office. And it, it usually, it, it works quite well, actually. There's, there hasn't been any complaint here um, about confidentiality having been breached. So it's been, it's been in place um, progressively since the beginning of the company, 96, and we have, we, we have a number of complaints uh, through the whistleblowing system, but no complaints related to the confidentiality of the system. So it works quite well. Um, the second question, okay, um, 
I've answered part part of it. How does the confidentiality of the complainant work? Um, well, once a report is made, it's not possible for anyone to trace it back to the individual other than the personnel of the safety and quality department if it's, a, if it's an operational uh, complaint. The managers who receive the complaints are trained specifically on how to maintain the confidentiality. Uh, the follow-up contact is done discreetly. Usually, like I said, you, uh, the, with uh, a contact done uh, to the home. And we're very, very serious about this uh, whistleblowing policy. So there is zero tolerance for the misuse of confidential information or even apparent repercussions to submitters. I think, Lisa, you're, you were going to um, answer some of the other questions that you had received. Lisa? Sorry about that. Hi, sorry, can you say that again? You, you, you were going to answer some of the other questions that you had received? Yes, I can do that. But before I, before I do that, it's just um, one of Madeline's polling questions just sparked something that I did want to tell our audience. I want to mention this. Um, one of her polling questions asked about, you know, how many of you out there have whistleblowing policies? And the majority of you do, according to the responses in the polls. Um, and I think one of the answers to that, potentially, so I want to flag this for you, is National Instrument 52110. So in Canada, for publicly traded companies, um, National Instrument 52-110 requires issuers to have an audit committee. And under Section 2.3 sub 7, an audit committee must establish procedures for inter alia, the confidential anonymous submissions by employees of the issuer of concerns regarding questionable accounting or auditing matters. So I suspect for many of you, that is one of the, um, one of the impetuses for your companies to have these internal policies well developed, such as Madeline speaks about. Um, the other interesting thing I see about her polling, and I don't know if Madeline wants to say anything about this later, is that only half of you think that it's effective, but many of you, about two-thirds of you, feel that you're properly protected from reprisals. So, you know, that's a really interesting um, result. Now I'm going to go back to some of the questions, because we didn't have time to answer all the questions that were asked. Um, one of the questions I got was, there's often a hierarchy between internal reports and external reports, but is there a difference between external reports to, for example, the police versus external reports made directly to a media outlet? So, yeah, great question. If you have to go outside, is there a hierarchy to where you should go outside first if you're going public, so to speak? And I think in Canada, you can probably take it that you should go to the appropriate authority first like the police or the agencies before you head out to the media unless the circumstances make that necessary. So much depends on your case. Um, and the place to go back to to start to sort of develop this concept of the hierarchy of where do you go when you go public, I think is we're going back to Laura Denning, master of the roles again, in initial services and puteral. And again, I think it's a case that's very useful to read because there's lots of good stuff in it. But he does say there um, that disclosure must be to the one who has the proper interest to receive the information. Um, and he gives us an example of disclosing information on crime to the police. And then he suggests that there may be cases where the misdeed is of such a character that the public interest may demand or at least excuse publication on a broader field even to the press. So very, you know, nuanced and factual based assessment of your specific issue. Now, I also got a question regarding one of our, one of the international cases that um, I presented on, which was Mr. Kessing in Australia. And the question here was, in the Australian case of Mr. Kessing, you mentioned a former public servant was criminally convicted for disclosing information to the media in the course of whistleblowing on alleged dangerous and criminal practices. 
from within a Crown institution. And the question is, could a whistleblowing public servant be similarly criminally prosecuted in Canada? And I can understand why you had that concern, because I did mention we have similar legislation. Now, having said that, um, you'd have to take a good look at the Public Servants Disclosure Protection Act, because that's probably the, the uh, act that's applicable. Um, but you have to know, it is one of these acts, and many of them do, they have a process for disclosure within. And where you see the process for disclosure within, you need to follow that process. So if, you, if the act is applicable to you, then you need to follow the process. And if you look at that act, one of the processes not available to you is going to be going directly to the media. And in fact, there's a warning that it could be cause for criminal prosecution. And the final question I've got is this. It's an employment question. An employer can dismiss whistleblowing employees in Canada with notice or pay in lieu of notice, and the only protection available is the fact of their whistleblowing can prevent a finding of dismissal for cause in which no notice is available. Are there other jurisdictions where greater protection is available? Okay, so that's a, that's a really good question as well because, yes, the common law in Canada is that employers can terminate employees uh, subject to there being collective agreement, but they can terminate employees um, without cause. And so, you know, whistleblowing legislation helps fill part of that gap when the circumstances demand it. Um, I think that the answer based on the presentation that I've given is that the very interesting False Claims Act, as well as the Section 21F Securities Exchange Act of 1934, the two what I call bounty acts, um, they do help mitigate the fact that whistleblowing employees can and often will be dismissed as a result of their disclosures, um, even though there's without cause of law. Um, and you've seen that. You've seen that in Glaxo Klein. So, you know, there was I'd say some mitigation, significant monetary mitigation afterwards, although you know it was a very, very long process. And those are all the questions I've got, so I'll turn it back to you, Samantha. Thank you, Lisa. There is one question to Madeline. Madeline, could you please read it out? Um, <clears throat> What has the uh, NAV Canada's experience been with frivolous or vexatious uh, submissions? Well, um, I, like I said in the presentation, even if, if it is a frivolous or vexatious submission, if there is a component of the submission that, although it's done for you know, reasons that, that shouldn't be, if there is a component of the submission that is valid, we will take it seriously. We will always take it seriously, and we will, we will always investigate it, and and then talk to the complainant. And we've been able to resolve them um, amicably um, by 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 talking to the complainant. There hasn't been very very many of those. Usually, there is a component. Of validity to the to the complaint to the submission, but when there hasn't been, the, the, it, it um, actually brought out other issues that needed to be resolved, um, other employee relations issues that we were able to resolve. Great, thank you. We've reached the conclusion uh, of our presentation. Thank you to, to all of the speakers. You've provided us with some essential and, and practical uh, information on whistleblowing best practices. To all participants, thank you for attending today's online webinar. If you're interested in receiving more guidance from the speakers, please find their contact details on your screen. Also, in addition to the link to today's presentation slides provided on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll be emailed a copy of the presentation slides along with several unanswered questions that were submitted today. We now invite you to take a couple of minutes to complete a brief online survey to be entered into a draw to win $100. To access the survey, please keep your browser window open and click on the link provided. Your input is especially valuable to us as we will use your feedback to craft the next webinar in this series. Thank you and good luck on the survey prize draw. <laughs>